Hey, we are a small snippet of Squanch Games, and we are here to tell you how excited we are to be a part of the Microsoft Games Show Extended. Game showcase Extended. You know, oh, Game Showcase, game showcase Extended. extended. What, what's the need for the extended? Why add that extra no, word? It's, it's like, we... like, is there one that's not extended? And that's why? We're getting nods. There is a, there is a not extended is. one, okay. And that one's just called without the extended. So that's just called uh, the X. There's the normal one. Yeah. I know what this is. Yeah. Well, hey, look, we're happy to be <laughs> a part of it nonetheless. Welcome to Xbox Game Showcase Extended. I'm Aaron, this is Malik, and we have the honor of diving deeper into some of the most exciting and talked about announcements, as well as gameplay from the Xbox and Bethesda Games Showcase just two days ago. For the first time ever, the entire showcase was focused on games you can play over the next 12 months. That's right, Aaron, you saw world premiere gameplay from Redfall and Starfield, and today we've got Bethesda's own Pete Hines right here to tell us more. You'll hear from the renowned developers behind the brand new Xbox franchise, Our History Untold. Dive into Naraka Blade Point with our partners at NetEase Games and so much more. But first, we begin with a special look at how our fans got to celebrate the Xbox and Bethesda Games Showcase with a message from our very own Phil Spencer. I love coming to events like this. You can just feel the energy, people loving to come together as a community, their love of video games, the Xbox fans. Just a really special time for everybody, myself included. Gaming has this unique ability to bring people together, whether it's saving the world from the aliens or winning a, a football game. It, it's so great. I love hearing from people, what did you like in the show? Those conversations with people that are here about areas that they like, in areas they wish we would do more. I think that's something that drives us. You saw it in the show today. People said, we want to see more gameplay. And so we said, okay, great. You're gonna see a ton of gameplay. Yeah, you know, I think this is our biggest lineup ever in terms of just diversity of different kinds of games from different kinds of teams, different genres. There's some franchises, Japanese franchises, don't always come to Xbox. We've been yeah. working on that. Today, we obviously had Persona. It's you know, important to us, we not only have all the games coming from our internal studios, but also great independent game developers that we work with around the world. So could not be more excited for what we're doing with Kojima. And he's got this really great idea for a game. And I want to be clear, because I know we say like experience and stuff, yeah. he's building a video game, but he has this real unique things that he wants to do in the game. And we said, okay, let's go do something together. 
And I'm just really proud to be in an industry that can be part of so many people coming together. Bethesda opened the showcase with a dramatic gameplay demo for Redfall and closed it with Todd Howard showing us how deep the rabbit hole goes on Starfield. And we also got a sneak peek at upcoming expansions for Elder Scrolls Online and Fallout 76. Here to break it all down for us is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Pete Hines from Bethesda. Pete, how are you? I'm great. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So about a month ago, you all announced some delays for both Redfall and Starfield. So I wanted to give you a chance to like Tell us a little bit about the decision-making process for that. Uh, absolutely. Look, with, with all the time that goes into a game, it, it would be foolish to rush it out the door before it's ready. I think we have continued to sort of examine how we think about games and, and making sure that they are going to meet our players' expectations. Obviously, the last two years have really challenged us from a development standpoint. Uh, how we work now largely re remotely um, while a lot of our folks are not back in the office. And, you know, that has an impact. I, I also think we've been thinking about things like release dates and when do we give those out and, and how do we make sure we give one out that, uh, that we actually hit and, and don't have to change later. So um, it's not something we undertake lightly, but at the end of the day, I think what our fans expect, what Xbox fans, what Bethesda fans expect is a, is a high quality game and, and we want to do everything we can to give our teams the time to to fully realize the, the games they're making. Yeah, and I think that's what it's all about, right? Like delivering an amazing experience for the players out there. And so speaking of games, we're just going to jump into it. We're going to start with how the showcase started with Sounds good. Redfall. Mm -hmm. uh, now, before we even get into the game, Arcane's making the game. And I want mm -hmm. you to talk a little bit about the pedigree of Arcane, just in case people don't know. Sure. These folks over there, they're doing their, their thing. Arcane Studios is known for really amazing, um, immersive uh, sims. They, they do any number of things. Um, if, you, if you play games of theirs, Dishonored, Dishonored 2, Prey, there's a lot of common threads you'll find in them. They create um, really amazing, believable worlds. I think that's a big part of their game is, is when you're in Dunwall or you're up on a, a space station and Prey, that it, it feels believable. There's a reason why things are the way they are. They're also also a big believers in systems based as opposed to scripted. So they, they really embrace player freedom and sort of giving players the tools to decide, you figure out how you want to complete this mission or get through this area. We're not going to tell you how, we're just going to give you tools and then give you the freedom to go and do. But you know, there's great characters and interesting story. They bring a lot of different elements and then really let the player create the experience they want. And that's what it's all about. Gamers have taken many games and made it their own. And I think the fact that Arcane is making the game with that in mind is super important. Now, how similar or dissimilar would you say this game, Redfall, is from the other Arcane? I mean, games? look, on the surface, it's a first person shooter that you can play solo or with you know, up to four players. And so immediately you might say, well, it's not a single player game, so it must be wildly different. And, and don't get me wrong, there's absolutely ways in which it is different. But 
I think when folks play the game and even when they see more of the game, I think they'll start to see all of those things about an arcane game that they that they love and appreciate. You know, why it's won multiple uh, action game of the year awards for Dishonor, for Dishonor 2, is their ability to, to bring all of those things together, really high level of polish and, and let folks experience it. And so I think all of those things we talked about. If you want to play a game by yourself and get a great arcane story, you can absolutely do that in Redfall. But you can also do things that you haven't been able to do in an arcane game, like experience it with friends and, and find out sort of how the whole can become greater than the sum of the parts, like playing it off of each um, character's abilities. You saw some of that in the demo that we showed. You know, I think the more that people appreciate that, you you almost are going to want to try and play Redfall a couple of different ways. You might want to play it by yourself a little bit, play it with others, and it's a game that allows you to do either or both of those things, however you see fit. I'm glad you talked about playing with friends because I'm taking applications for friends to help me get through Redfall. Um, Can can I put my name on that list? I'm down to a little... It'd be an honor. Pete, keep me on that list. All we right, we need to go it. explore Redfall together. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait for that. And so let's talk a little bit more about the game. Now, um, you know, between the trailer that we saw last year at the reveal, mm-hmm. as well as this one that we just saw, uh, I feel like Redfall reminded players of other co-op shooters like uh, Left 4 Dead, for example. Mm-hmm. What makes Redfall unique? Um, again, it's one of those things, like, if you if you watch just, like, combat footage, you might look at Left 4 Dead or Back 4 Blood or, or any of these things and go, oh, I see multiple characters facing a bunch of enemies, and, like, so it's the same game. But I think that's that would be doing a disservice, that it's all of the things that take place in between the combat as well as the combat itself, sort of combining different skills and abilities in, in the way that you do, you know, Layla dropping down a, an elevator using her, her powers that Jacob can use to get up top on a on a roof and provide cover. You know, you have different characters who play roles really well, how you choose to use Brebone, um, the robot. All of those things come into, again, allowing the players not to say, here's a set of rules and you can only use, like, no, here's just some stuff that you can go off into this amazing sort of dynamic, ever-changing world and sort of experience and explore for yourself. And you come back the next day and it'll look and feel like a different experience, even though you're in the exact same part of the game. I mean, I think those are the kinds of things that Arcane does that really um, bring that sort of extra special element that makes their game so compelling. Yeah, compelling and fresh. So I'm excited for Redfall, and you said it here uh, for everyone to see that we're going to be playing together. So I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, absolutely. You got the proof. All right. Can't wait. Oh, awesome. So let's talk about Elder Scrolls Online. Mm-hmm. Now, I wanted to talk about the team philosophy, because I hear that uh, the team is actually banned from saying things like, now is the perfect time to My play. My least favorite saying is there's never oh, no. been a better time to play a game. Like, we all say that. <laughs> yes, games always get oh, better. We man. know that. The, the thing that we love about where Elder Scrolls Online is, is, is going is their ability to continually refresh the experience for players, provide new experiences, like going to High Isle, a place they've never been in an Elder Scrolls game. It does a lot of things like story and intrigue. There's a lot of politics in High Isle, different factions and, and the, the conflict that's going on there. And again, a, a way that you can jump in and play by yourself and experience it at, by yourself, even though it's an MMO, but the real special sauce of Elder Scrolls Online is our amazing community. They're so welcoming. They're so helpful. You know, if you need a little bit of help, if you need a lot of help, they're there for, um, they're, they're there for you to help explain, to, you know, to make sure you have a fun experience. And honestly, like that is such a huge part for an online game of creating an environment where anybody, no matter whether you just started playing or you've been playing for eight years, can have a good experience no matter how you decide to engage with it. I love that you mentioned that. Uh, community is such, a, as you mentioned, is such a huge part of any online game. And so for players who may not have played Elder Scrolls, who are, like you said, looking to jump in, to know that they have that community backing them uh, that's going to help them guide them in their journey mm-hmm. is super exciting. So, But I want to talk about Fallout a little bit. Okay. Um, huge milestone recently, 25 years of Fallout. It can rent a car even now. <laughs> At this point, right? We're talking about it. All right, so this has to mean something uh, super special to the team. Absolutely, and 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 look, we are as aware of anybody. Like this, this franchise did not start with Bethesda. It's one that we took on along the way, and our intent is not just to to pay homage to like Bethesda Fallout. Like, no, we mean all Fallout because what this series has done, what it what it meant to us as players when we went and played those games, played the original Fallout, Fallout Two. Um, and then what the franchise has become and sort of growing and finding an even 
you know, a new audience with Fallout 3, Fallout 4, Fallout New Vegas, uh, Fallout 76 is something we really want to celebrate. And honestly, the, you know, what's going on in Fallout 76 with the pit and your ability to continue to push the boundaries in an online game of story and meaningful player choice. And as you're going along, making decisions that kind of um, matter and have a real impact, I think, is is important in the evolution of Fallout 76. And just honestly, how far that game has come from its launch. Like, we're keenly aware of how that launch went, but we are also keenly aware of the incredible amount of effort and dedication from all of our teams across Bethesda to say, like, we believe in this thing and we want to give the fans more of what they want and the kind of experiences that they want. And where Fallout 76 is now is truly remarkable when you go back and look at sort of where we were and how far we've come and, and honestly how much cool stuff is in store in the pit. It's, it's going to be super fun. Excited to jump in. And again, that's one of those things that I'm sure you guys attribute to the community, giving that feedback. You know, that, that 76 community, again, not just in the game, but what they do for for each other to support other folks in the community, what they have done to raise funds for worthwhile causes. Like, it's not just an amazing group of gamers. It's an amazing group of human beings and, and honestly, one that we're honored to interact with and be a part of every day. I love that, Pete. Before you make me cry, we're going to move on to Starfield, <laughs> right? Okay. All right, so let's talk about it. Starfield, end of the show. I got to say, watching the trailer breathtaking. It's one of those things from the different locations and just seeing the difference between that moon versus the populated city. Just amazing. The dog fighting, uh, the, just everything was so awesome. The team really outdid themselves. It's one like. of those things about a Bethesda Games a Studios game that I always love. And, and it's been the case, honestly, since, you know, I, I worked on Morrowind and Oblivion and all those games that, you know, we talked about. And ev for every single one, you cannot pin people down to, oh, it's about this, because it's not. Like, ultimately what those games are are massive sandboxes where they give players just ridiculous amounts of freedom to say, you go figure out what kind of game you want to play and what kind of experience you want to have, because that's what this game is about. It's not us prescribing and saying, you have to do these things. And Like, no, it's about creating this huge uh, sandbox with an over a thousand planets so you can completely explore and say, yeah, but you don't have to. Like, it's entirely up to you to figure out what, what is fun for me. Do I want story? Do I want to join factions? Do I want to, you know, build outposts and gather resources to build more cool stuff? The team really puts all of those tools in the player's hands and step back and says, now it's time for you to, to tell the story of Starfield, which is your story, which is going to be different than mine, which is going to be different than everybody else's. And I think that's that's really where the magic of a Bethesda Game Studios game happens. Speaking about the scope of everything, Todd said that this is what an epic RPG is. What, what does Bethesda define an epic RPG as? I, I think, again, it's, it's sort of leaning into, look, there's a lot of folks who take a lot of different approaches on what does an open world mean. And Bethesda Game Studios always pushes themselves to the most freedom and least limitations, right? Where... The items in the world are all real things. You walk into a store and there's a bunch of weapons or whatever. Like, that's not just art on a countertop. Like, you could pick those up. You could steal them and run out of it. You can create chaos. Like, we don't want to put too many limits on what the player is or isn't allowed to do. We love it when players say, I wonder what happens if... And then they try it. And then they get to see, like, oh, my Lord, chaos ensued and it was insanity. Everybody was shooting at me. And, like, that's, I think, the beauty of Bethesda Game Studios and the, and the number of ways that they push for you to explore that, right? It's not just one. It's you could spend thousands of hours doing nothing but shipbuilding and, like, focus that as all you're about, and that's okay. But you could also be about exploring every planet and finding all of the good, and that's okay. Or you could just play the main story and be like, I want a kind of experience that I'm guided through so that I kind of get to see stuff, and I might stop here and there. Oh, there's a cool side quest that I got, but... You know, I want something that sort of leads me through because I'm a little, you know, it can be a little daunting to say you can go do whatever I want. Like, ooh, I don't know what I should do. So th some folks want a little bit of a guided path or to understand where the fun is and no approach is wrong. Like for me, that's epic because it says we aren't putting any limits on what you can or can't do. 
we're going to set you loose and just sit back and watch the, the beauty that you create with your own stories and the way that you solve problems or choose to spend your time in this world we've created. I love that. And I, you know, what you said about, um, you know, those moments that maybe you, you experience that I don't, like those are some of the best moments if I think back to playing RPGs when I'm discussing with my friends, oh, did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Where did you see it? And, and having them go out and find it. So I think that's going to be one of those we, things. We talk about that a lot, that sort of water cooler moment. Exactly. Like you come yeah. in the next day and you talk to everybody about what you did and you were like, wait, I did that quest, but I did this completely different thing. And you sort of start to appreciate all of the choices that you could have made. You didn't even realize were an option. Like, oh, I didn't even think about doing that. Like, oh yeah, I just ran in and stole his ship and shot all of his crew members and took off. Like, you can do that. Like, oh yeah, you can do anything. Like that, I think that is... Um, a special part of a Bethesda Game Studios game. And, and when we say epic RPG, we mean all of the stories, all of them. All right, you just gave me some ideas for stealing people's ships. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, that's going to be top on the list to do in Starfield. Now, um, we saw quite a bit of combat and action in the game. That seems to also be, in, in addition to exploring and everything, that seems to be a, another huge focus of the uh, game. Absolutely. I mean, you know, look, if you look at a game like Skyrim, which, like, Everybody's played Skyrim at this point. It, it can, you know, a combat is a big part of that, unless you decide it's not. Like, if you're one of those folks that says, actually, I'm going to do the alchemy thing, and I just go off and pick flowers and make potions and, like, live another life in another world this way, then combat isn't part of it. But look, we know in an epic RPG, there's always bad people, they, you know, shooting at you. Sometimes you got to return fire, and there's a lot of fun to be had there. And so, you know, providing a lot of different skills that, sort of determine how good you are in combat combined with all the different weapons in the game and then you layer in ship combat and all of these other things, it starts to sort of paint a picture of just how broad or how deep the rabbit hole goes. It's going to be so impressive. Um, and you touched on it a little bit and I want to talk about it because this was when I'm watching the, the video, the demo, um, what I saw and it really caught my eyes around the ship. Um, it's not just getting in the ship and that's your ship. There's so much behind it. Can you so talk much. about it a little bit? Yeah, like every ship is customizable to the nth degree and not just like cosmetically. I want my ship to look like this or look like that, though obviously that's totally a thing that you could do if you, all you care about is cosmetics. But it goes much deeper than that in terms of like what kind of shields you have, what kind of weapons you have, like what kind of ship are you building? What do you want it to be good at? What trade-offs are you willing to make or not? And then the other part of it is, of course, well, you can't just, like, it's a spaceship. Those aren't cheap. So you have to figure out, like, how am I going to do this? Where do I get the resources to build this stuff? What kind of, you know, skills do I need to level up to improve different parts of my ship beyond, you know, what I could do without those skills? So there's a lot of, again, choices in terms of you get to decide that, how much you want to Put into that or not? Do you just want to give somebody money for the parts that you want? Do you want to build it? All of those things are, are sort of part of the fun of deciding how much do you want to interact with this and how do you want to interact with it? Absolutely. I mean, just as you mentioned, the scope, the level of player agency, something that I feel like is going to just make Starfield such a, a special experience. So between Redfall, ESO, Fallout 76, and Starfield, you all are just we got a few games game. coming. Yeah, we got a few games coming out. It's going to be so great. Um, Pete, thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course, Pete. Now, coming up, we'll hear from our friends around the world, including Squanch Games, Obsidian Entertainment, Playground Games, and of course, Xbox fans like you. But first, let's hear from the creators of one of the world's most popular Battle Royale games. We are glad to share Naraka Playpoint, a unique online multiplayer action game with players all around the globe. As a NetE studio, 24 Entertainment is joining hands with Microsoft to bring Naraka Playpoint to consoles for the first time. You could play the game on Xbox Series X and S as well as Windows next week. We're also joining Xbox Game Pass, a platform with a huge player base and a vast, bright future. Naraka has been so well received on the PC platform. I am so grateful to the players for their love and support. As a competitive survival game incorporating a lot of action elements, Naraka features a range of characters with unique personalities. Each hero draws from different civilizations and cultures. Battles allow for a great degree of strategic play. You've got a wealth of melee and ranged weapons to choose from, 
and a vast map filled with interactive elements to explore. Perhaps you'll engage your foes in samurai combat, katanas at the ready, or maybe you'll use Persian assassin techniques and strike from afar. With your grappling hook, you can fly between temple walls and across bamboo forests with ease. Beyond solo endeavors, you can also party up with friends and use group tactics to flatten your foes. That's Naraka's underlying design philosophy, that you're unchained and have the freedom to choose how you play. Collect soul jades to change how you play, transform your katana strikes, and make your cannon a weapon of mass destruction. Each hero can be customized too. Whether you want to rush into battle as a berserker warrior or cast fireballs as a sorcerer, the choice is yours. We can't forget to mention our unique face customization system too. You'll never need to worry about running into a doppelganger on the battlefield because you're able to edit your hero's features to your heart's content. You can even recreate your favorite faces. As we approach Naraka's first launch anniversary, we're introducing a brand new weapon, the Twin Blades, releasing together with the Xbox and Game Pass editions. Twin Blades strike with the speed of a raging tempest and sweeping blows. We've seen similar weapons in other games, but here in Naraka, it comes with a style all its own. Charging up strikes is usually a high-risk, high-reward move. With the Twin Blades, you can charge up while moving and keep your momentum as you unleash a flurry of combos on foes. Since its release, Naraka Blade Point has launched its own Faction Clash game mode with Omni's Nightmare and the thrilling limited time mode Shadow Surge. There have been many casual modes to play as well, but our community has eagerly asked for a campaign mode. We're always listening to our player base, and we're happy to announce that the wait is over. Players will see the first chapter of our campaign mode, form teams of three to take on new enemy types and massive bosses. Disarming a boss won't be as easy as disarming another player though. PvP and campaign mode are two entirely different games. Further campaign chapters are also in the works, so we're eager to hear any feedback you have for us. We are also working on an Xbox One version and hope to see more players join Naraka later this year. Naraka is launching on Xbox Series X and S and Windows Store on June 23rd, and it's included with Game Pass at launch day. Now's your chance to dive into the world of Naraka Blade Point. History is filled with moments of greatness. Some well known, some lost to time. But what about the history that could have been if you were its architect? How would you reshape the world? What new stories would you tell? And when your people speak, would you listen? How would you lead them in this new world? History is filled with moments of greatness. But these will be yours. I'm excited to welcome our friends from Oxide Games for a closer look at their historical grand strategy game for PC called Aura History Untold. Dan, Michelle, thank you two for joining us today. 
Thank you for having us. And on behalf of the entire studio, we are really excited to be here and finally be able to talk about Aura. I mean, we all are excited too. You just had the world premiere two days ago for Aura. And I have to say, I'm a really, really big history fan. I love me some history. So I've been looking forward to talking to you two about this. Now, we all know this is not your first strategy game, but the vision behind Aura is so ambitious. So tell us more about it. And also for those who are new to Oxide Games, we would love to hear more about the studio as well. So Oxide Games was founded nine and a half years ago in my basement, actually, uh, from the development leads of Civilization V. And our goal is to push strategy games to the next level. And what's really great about working on a new IP is that you don't have kind of these previous expectations that a sequel would have. And so the sky really was the limit and we got to really take the genre to a new space. And we really hope that not only will fans of strategy games like this, but people who've never played a strategy game before will find something they love as well. You're absolutely taking it to the next level. I, I think I saw like a drone was in like the 18th century or something like that. It's very, very fascinating. And I think that like, if you're someone who really enjoys history, it's bringing like all the worlds together, all the periods of time together. And that's a grand vision in itself. So how does the vision of Aura impact the player experience within the game? So one of the kind of big things we wanted to do with Aura was really explore how to make the game less about finding that optimal strategy, that optimal path, and really bring in ways to make it more meaningful to the player, make it unique to themselves. So what are different kinds of choices we can bring to the player so that when you play, it's different than when I play, and yet we can both be competitive together? Um, how can we do things to really impact agency and expression and really let you express your values and your play styles through the different mechanics in the product? Uh, and Dan, what about you? How does the vision impact the overall experience? So one of the big things that we've been working on is what we call the living world. We wanted uh, the expression of the game to manifest itself in a way that was felt authentic and cool. So we've spent a lot of, of effort on making sure that the choices that you make are expressed in a visual way. And so you're going to see your citizens doing things that reflect the choices that you've made. And this is actually really challenging. So one of the, the goals when we, we founded Oxide was to not have to tell the designers, no, you can't do that thing. And so the game is obviously huge. It's, it's, it's just massive. And so it was a, a very large technological constraint from doing something like that. But we have our own proprietary engine that allows us to really bring a, a, this, this alternate earth to life. I think that's the beauty, right? Because in history, the great thing about learning history is that you learn about culture, you learn about stories, you learn about things that are probably brand new to your eyes. But the way that Aura helps you remix, reimagine, and rewrite history is a beautiful sight to see. And I'm excited to get my hands on it, and I'm sure everyone else is who's watching. So let us know, where can we learn more about it, and when can we get our hands on it? Because I need it today. So if you head over to the website, you can sign up for the Insider Program, um, which will give you a chance to join the Technical Alpha and play the game later this summer, which is super exciting because we've been playing it, you know, all the time. And so now you have a chance to play. Dan, Michelle, thank you two so much for giving us the lowdown on Aura. Really appreciate it. Thanks thank for, having for having us. us. Grounded is finally leaving early access and moving into full release with a highly anticipated story mode. Here's Adam Brennicky and Eric Dorabella from Obsidian Entertainment to tell us more. What can players expect from the 1.0 launch of Grounded? The big one, of course, is going to be a complete game, and that means story, right? You know, from beginning to end, you can play through, you know, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Who put you here? Yeah, exactly. And how are you going to get home? And I think those are like the big questions that people are asking about Grounded. Originally, we really just wanted to make a survival game. And one of the jokes was, hey, what if we did backyard survival? Everyone was like, yeah, that's, that's a very unusual idea, but I think there's something there. One of the things that we did early on was establish the art style of Grounded. Things started like coming to life as we did the initial prototypes and like seeing some of the cool things like the first time we added like the spider into the yard, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, seeing the reactions of people in the office, like even like jump scares, like people screaming. The team is very small. It's the smallest team I've ever worked on at Obsidian. I wanted everyone to be able to participate on the design side of things. So I said, everyone is a designer on the team. And I think that extends into our community and how we're building the game in game preview and early access. That's probably one of the big successes of the game is how close 
we work with the community mm -hmm. and take all their feedback and suggestions. I think it's super rad. For a game developer too, that is a, a huge, huge thing just to get people's feedback constantly of what they're liking, what they're not liking. And all those adjustments just make a much, much better game at the end of the day. We're at that point now that the yard's getting finished and now we can play through the story. There's a lot of surprises. There's a lot of, uh, you know, things that I think players aren't going to expect. And I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I cannot wait to see players' reactions. I know a lot of players are just waiting for the story to be finished, to finally jump into the game. People who play the game previously are also like holding out for, for more content. I think it's just going to pull a lot of people back in and, and gain a lot of new players. So Adam, we have the Broodmother from last year. It was like our first big boss. And then we came out with a bunch of mini bosses like Termite King. Termite King and the yes. assistant manager. <laughs> but in this trailer, uh, we're showing players the Mantis. What, what yeah, can they expect from this? So we're super excited to, to finally show off the Mantis. I know that's been a, a big ask from players that they want to see a, a praying Mantis in the game. They've been asking for this for a yes. long yeah. time. So, do we have anything else that the players can get excited about? You know, the Mantis is just a little tease of one of the new boss fights, but there's more to come, right? Like potentially many boss fights that we, we have planned for, for the full release of Grounded. Um, there's a lot more secrets and other things to uncover. When we reached 5 million players, that was already super crazy. And then we hit the next milestone of 10 million players still being Xbox. Doubling it, right? Yeah, in Xbox Game Preview Early Access. That just goes to show that we have a, a fantastic game. Everyone's just so surprised at yeah. like how, how, how much ground it has grown. I just hope that players and the community understand how important they are and impactful on this game with us. You know, we're so thankful for our, everyone's support along the way. It's been an amazing journey, and we're finally at, almost at the finish line, right? Yeah. And I think uh, we wouldn't be here without our amazing community and all of the fan support. I agree. Best community ever. ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
and Microsoft celebrating its 40th anniversary. It's a match made in heaven, mm -hmm. and there's lots of things we can do. Yeah, authenticity, accuracy, access, it's all there. We're hoping that if everyone has as much fun in the community with the content that we initially collaborated on, a couple of our most historic aircraft, and some of the other aircraft in this center are already in the simulator, maybe we can jump in with both feet and do more in the years to come. Maybe even, who knows, we'll go crazy. We'll put the space shuttle in there. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> All right, you guys have never been here before, no, right? No, nope. this is my first All time. All right, so uh, keep your eyes peeled, stick stick together, and uh, Jorg, I've got something special for you right around here. Perfect. Check this out. This is my favorite plane, the Junker Su-52 three motor. Amazing. And that, that is an awesome plane. And as I look at all these planes around here, it makes me ask the question, are you gonna put all of them in flight, Tim? Uh, maybe not all of them, but we hope a lot of them. In the 40th anniversary that comes out this fall, we already have three. We have the Wright Flyer, the Spirit of St. Louis, and the DC-3. And we hope to get a few more. As Nick and I were talking, there's a lot of things we could do. Yeah, we started with the most iconic ones, and uh, who knows? There's no lack of opportunity. You know, I keep saying amazing because this place is amazing. And just like Flight Sim, it just keeps going. So what else is happening? It does seem like we're going supersonic, like the Concorde here. We've been doing a major update ever since we launched, every month since uh, August 2020. And just today, we're actually launching World Update 10. And guess what? Tell me. It's the United States. And it's huge. We have a dozen cities, a new height field, brand new aerials, new missions, new airports, new everything. And as always, it's free. And check out this beauty. This is the Beechcraft Model 18. They call it the Twin Beach. It's a famous plane, and that's also launching today. And it's a great coincidence. It's actually a huge coincidence. Jorg's been working on that Beechcraft since before we met, but it's a great example of how much we already had in common. So Jorg, what can we expect the rest of the year from Flight Sim? We have a ton of great things coming up. So today is World Update 10. We have two more World Updates, one in August and one in October. And then in November, we have the big 40th anniversary edition, which will be an absolute delight for anyone who loves aviation. Okay, that 40th anniversary edition, tell me more about that. Yeah, so we're celebrating by bringing back some of the, the planes from the old sims, like from Flight Sim 10, 9, 8, even before that. And we're restoring some of the old missions and we're bringing back some of the airports that were in those editions. So it's a real celebration of the franchise. So this celebration is not only of the franchise, but the past as well. And we're also adding brand new things on top of it, like that the community really wanted. For example, helicopters. My Sobo wrote a brand new fluid dynamic system to make all that work. And then we're adding gliders, which is a completely different way to experience the planet. It's just you and the wind. Right. And then the last one is we're bringing, it's the biggest deal for simmers, a brand new real to life airliner, the A310 oh, wow. from Airbus, yeah. by a brand new partner called Inibills, a great development team. In fact, of the 10 planes we're bringing, most of them are created in collaboration with third parties. So it's a really cool way for us to integrate with the creator community. Now, how do I get this? If you're on Game Pass, if you already own Flight Sim, the 40th anniversary edition is a free upgrade. This has just been an incredible experience, seeing all these planes and going through the history and everything that's come in the Flight Simulator. I mean, thank you so much. Thanks for coming to DC. Paris, thank you, Nick, for the great collaboration with the Smithsonian and for kicking off the 40th anniversary edition of Flight Sim. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Today was a good day, but now I have a need for speed. I'm headed to the danger zone, baby. aquí para disfrutar del mejor día de mi vida, el día de la Xbox, que estoy muy emocionado. I came in Madrid just yesterday to be here in Fanfest Xbox and I'm so excited. Estamos aquí en Madrid para ver eh, nuevos juegos como Starfield, que yo personalmente le tengo muchísimas ganas. Me ha encantado y no me lo, no me lo podía perder, este es un evento único. Why gaming? Just a passion. Es una experiencia única. Me ofrecen algo que, que no encuentro en otro lado.
lo, lo que te digo, es como una familia para mí. Me ha parecido genial y un cierre para, para un evento así, eh, maravilloso. Just the passion that people have. I feel very welcome. Hey, we're just a snippet of Squanch Games and we're here to talk about High on Life, our new action, adventure, comedy, Metroidvania, first person shooter that uh, is nothing at all, a little bit like Microsoft Excel. All right, you're a bounty hunter now. You gotta help me rescue my friends. They're Gatlians just like me. That's our game, High on Life. Pretty insane. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Let's dive in. So Justin, you're typically known for working in animation. What brings you into the world of games? Why are you in the world of games? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm obsessed with games, have been my whole life. Always had ideas, always had, you know, things I would love to make, but just never thought I could ever step into that arena because I don't, I lack. I lack all the skills needed. <laughs> you don't know how other games than, work. Other than like creative uh, direction, creative ideas, like like other than that, I lack all the skills to execute. But that's why, like that's part of why you want to start Squanch, right? Is like to be able to have an idea like that and let it grow to something amazing. And, 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 and to be able to be, be creatively yeah. um, free. I wanted to make games that I wanted to play. And that was sort of the spark that just lit the fire of Squanch games and then we shipped Trover and we shipped Accounting Plus, and now we're on this absolutely dream game. This is like our real legit swing at like a proper, you know, like we're indie, but like this is like our triple A, like, yeah. or is it triple I for, like, for indie? Yeah. We're triple I. Yeah, yeah, this is a triple I game. So the story of our game mostly follows like Earth being invaded by this evil criminal cartel of aliens who come in and kidnap humans and start selling them on the black market like they're drugs. And you're the one human who has to team up with a talking gun and stop them. And when you select a, a cartel leader that you're gonna go after, like it opens the, the portal door <laughs> to that world that they're in. Eric, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the worlds of the game, the art style of the game, the visuals. Yeah, yeah. So we spent a lot of time kind of constructing and creating these awesome alien worlds. Uh, myself and uh, Mikey Spano, who is our art director, him and I worked like a ton on the sort of art direction of the game. He really kind of landed in this space, which was kind of Blade Runner meets the Muppets. <laughs> so we're trying to capture that feeling with all of our characters, and especially our aliens. Uh, and then each world is its own kind of unique flavor, right? I think some of the ideas came from very kind of core thoughts. Like we were like, we want to have an awesome alien, like drug dense spa on an asteroid. And yeah, what makes me really excited is the sort of really clear and like, it's almost deceivingly simple narrative, right? Save the earth, human to drugs, talking guns. So Alec, what you know? What who are the guns? What's their deal? The guns are these talking alien Gatlians. Um, they they're all shaped somewhat like a gun you'd find on Earth, but they've evolved to be just gun-like in their own way. And so uh, this race of Gatlians each has their own unique personality, their unique set of abilities, and you're going to be rescuing them from this evil alien cartel. And together, you got to stop the bad guys. And get more Gatlians. Yeah, get more, collect more Gatlians. Yeah, a lot of players are gonna have very different experiences depending on what gun they favor. Yeah, you can kind of um, pick your favorite companion to have out a lot and hear their dialogue, yeah. be part of different reliable. different different uh, dialogue scenes and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Look at us, blasting away! And sometimes you can unlock the guns in a different order than another player has. That's so when you right. go back through a level, you'll see things that you would have been able to access if you'd done it in the other order. That's you so, can come back. That's a yeah. huge one. All right, so we've talked about this crazy good game that sounds amazing. Why should people be excited to play it? As a studio, we are attempting to bring a-level adult comedy into video games. Something I love about Squanch is we would put a lot of effort into things that a lot of other studios wouldn't even bother, like like a single small joke that five players might find. Well, okay, well now, well now I sorta, now I can. I love that stuff. I, I love like edge casing and like, it's like, what makes you remember a game. Like, yeah, like, like if a player's trying to break the game in a certain way and then you, you have an answer for that for them, that is like such a memorable and amazing uh, moment. 
it's almost like watching TV, but the viewer is able to reach into the TV and, and poke a thing, and the character has to respond to that. And there's so much fun to be had for the You can most skip part. it all. We worked really hard on it if you want to skip it. Yeah, if you want to just like miss out on like, you know, Yeah, if you're like coolest... a big dummy and you don't want to play the game at all, that's fine. <laughs> We're not going to judge you. We're just going to be upset. <laughs> Pentiment is a narrative adventure game set in 16th century Bavaria, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire. You play a character named Andreas Mahler, who is an artist working at a Benedictine abbey. Uh, he gets involved in a series of murders and scandals and tries to unravel them over a period of about 25 years. The name Pentiment, it is specifically referring to paintings in which there's an older painting underneath the painting that you see on the top. And if you scrape away the top layer, you see what was left behind. Uh, this has a bunch of significance. Obviously, you're playing a painter, but also it has a lot of significance to the idea of history kind of being covered and uncovered over time. When I saw narrative-driven games with really distinctive art styles, I was inspired to make a historical game that uh, focused on the unique art style of the early modern period that was really driven by the relationships between characters and the stories that played out over time. Hannah Kennedy was really integral to defining the art style of Pentiment, especially blending the late medieval illuminated manuscripts with the early modern woodcuts. Yeah, so there's a lot of major points to solve and kind of marry between wanting this to be a true to the history, true to the feel of the source material that we were referencing as far as the narrative, but also thinking about the types of games that were like what we imagined we wanted as far as a gameplay experience. From the beginning, I knew that I wanted to portray a community that changed over time, which meant that characters are changing over time. That's really the, the focus of everything. Um, the buildings do change, but really it's the characters where you see all the, the crazy stuff happen. Kids that I had become attached to because it's a four-year-old, we designed one to be a four-year-old, and then they're getting married, and then I felt a weird like emotional reaction to that because I'm like, oh, baby's all grown up. I think the 16th century has always been really interesting to me because it was a time of such social upheaval in Europe. I think when we look at social change in the past, it seems like it's a thing that always happens outside of our time. But right now, I think we're maybe more aware of than ever that social change is happening constantly and people are always struggling with it. It's always a difficult process. And so I hope that by looking at people from the past, we can see that even though the setting might be different and the specific issues might be different, ultimately we always struggle with social change. All right, let's do crime. This is such a bad idea. All you had to do was keep your mouth shut. I'm gonna override oh, this. No. Is your life mission to cause harm? Yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite shot of the whole game, this one. 
With As Dusk Falls, what we're trying to do is to make a brilliant interactive experience for anyone who loves brilliant storytelling. So people who enjoy films, people who enjoy TV series. It's also a social experience and about sharing these stories with the people you love. I think we should stick to the plan. Yes, yeah, stick to the plan. I took my inspiration from TV shows, prestige shows like, you know, Breaking Bad, Fargo. I really love Dog Day Afternoon. It's such a wonderful setup. You try that again, and every last one of them leaves in a body bag. When you write for interactive stories, it's all about the stakes. You want big choices, the tentpole ones that everyone will remember from the chapter they played, but also you weave in the smaller stakes, the drama bit, like the relationships. Uh, are you gonna stay married? When you lost your job, this wall went up, and I missed you, okay? The game deals with very mature themes that you don't normally find in a video game. It really gives you agency over characters that are relatable, that are familiar to you. It's like an interactive story, but with the power of video game behind it. I only gotta yell and my brothers will come. Now hold your horses, young man. I think you should at least listen to what I have to say. In the first book, it's mainly structured around a hostage situation in a motel in the middle of the desert in Arizona, so it's a pressure cooker. You want your wife to live? Answer and do exactly what I say. Book two takes another uh, approach entirely, and it's a chase across multiple states in the US. <sighs> There's nowhere else to run. As Dust Falls is an interactive show, but the important part here is the word interactive. The players are very much needed to help the character on their journey and decide what's gonna happen to them, help them grow and change. It's not like there's one golden path. There's so many different ways through the story. You can replay it and then you get to like different story and different ending and you feel like you're actually achieving something and shaping the story and also the character. Some of your true self comes out into that thinking. I don't know, what would you do? I'll try to, yeah. And at the end of the game when you play, we tell you about your playstyle, and it reveals something about the player themselves, their values and the way they interact with the others that they played with. I think for me, one of, one of the really important things was that this art style could tell lots of different types of stories. We want to take really beautiful, sort of subtle facial performances, really strong dramatic moments, and just really represent that, such that every frame is a painting. It's a single player and multiplayer experience, so one to eight players. Because we wanted to draw in people who weren't necessarily gamers. Gamers are going to love this game as well because it's a very mature, in-depth story. But this game really taps into your life skills rather than your gamer skills. Puts everyone on a level playing field. You did well there, that is a ferocious dog. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me, I did it! You, did it. You, did it. <laughs> you share the same character, you discuss, you make decisions, and majority wins. It's like each player is like a voice in the character head. Are you taking your money this time? I am definitely not. Take the cash. It's been a massive journey and I can't believe we're just like so close, touching distance to this game. Yeah, I'm gonna miss it when it's done. Let's check out what mysteries, adventures, and, of course, slimes are waiting for us in the new vibrant world of Slime Rancher 2.
All right, time to get going. First trip in a while. Put this in here. Australia. Passport. I need a passport. Where's my passport? Passport, passport. my uber all right let's go let's go oh. to Melbourne. It is so great to be here in person. Get ready for the showcase. We are so excited to tell you all about Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels, the first expansion for Forza Horizon 5. So Mike, let's start with why the team decided to bring Hot Wheels to Forza Horizon 5's Mexico. Our fans have been telling us for years about how much they loved Forza Horizon 3's Hot Wheels expansion. So we've been waiting for the right time to bring everyone another Hot Wheels adventure. Forza Horizon 5 presented the perfect opportunity to bring Hot Wheels to life like never before with the power of the Xbox Series X and S. It really does sound like the perfect time for Forza Horizon and Hot Wheels. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what to expect being in the clouds of Mexico this time. Yes, you travel to the clouds above Mexico to visit the Hot Wheels Park, which is comprised of over 200 kilometers of the fastest, most extreme tracks yet. Once there, you'll join the Hot Wheels Academy and set out to take on Forza Horizon's most extreme racing yet and prove yourself a Hot Wheels legend. Let's go as well as the iconic orange Hot Wheels track. You'll take on new driving experiences across gravity-defying magnet tracks, as well as ice, water flume, and rumble tracks. So we spoke loads about biomes in the build-up to Forza Horizon 5's launch. Are we expecting something similar in Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels as well? Yes, so we're truly going to see the power of the Xbox Series X and S when we look at Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels' all-new biomes. The amount of detail and diversity that we can pack into the four new biomes is breathtaking. We have the rugged Giants Canyon, where you'll hear the growl of your engine bouncing back off the intricately detailed rock formations. The Ice Cauldron, where frozen tundra drips into the glistening molten lava. In Forest Falls, you'll see a tree canopy towering over epic waterfalls. And finally, the visually stunning and exhilarating Horizon Nexus, where the Horizon Festival is suspended among a web of Hot Wheels tracks. And there's more, because new players can jump into Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels as early as possible during the main game's initial experience. And how are people going to be able to use Event Lab in Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels? So in Event Lab, you'll have the freedom to design, build and share using the new Hot Wheels Creation Kit. That's over 80 new track and stunt pieces that instantly snap together thanks to our new building tools. You can then share your creations with the entire community for players to discover and play. We are anticipating our community building an ever-evolving catalogue of new player-created Hot Wheels events that everyone will enjoy. They all sound absolutely incredible, Mike, but I'm going to ask you the most important question in the room. Can you tell me a bit more about the cars? Yes. So we have 10 new amazing cars come into the pack, including four new Hot Wheels cars, which have been scaled up to real-life proportions. We have the Diora 2, the Bad to the Blade, the Baja Bone Shaker, and the Chevrolet Hot Wheels Copo Camaro. 
Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels introduces the most extreme tracks we've seen yet in Forza. So we've added some new extreme track toys and hypercars to go with them. That's fat. <laughs> I want to call out the Hennessy Venom F5 and the Mosler MT900 GT3. Their speed is unlike anything we've seen before. So we know Forza Horizon 5 fans naturally love co-op, so how is that continuing in Hot Wheels? So, in a first for Forza, you can join up with your friends and play from the very start of the experience oh, okay. in co-op. You and your friends will then take on a new campaign, moving your way up through faster and faster car classes until you unlock the extreme speed of X-Class and become a Hot Wheels legend. You can also choose to take on the world in Horizon Open or team up with your friends to take on a team of driver tars in the Horizon Tour. Ooh, I absolutely love that. Final question now, though. When can we expect to play? Yes, so Forza Horizon 5 Hot Wheels releases on July 19th on Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, Windows PC and Steam. Mike, thank you so much for joining me. This has been so much fun and I cannot wait to play. Now onto our next block, pun intended of course, Minecraft Legends is the action strategy take on the franchise you never knew you needed. I'm here with Dennis Rees from Mojang Studios who has just released the world premiere trailer of Minecraft Legends. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Malik. So happy to have you. I mean, this is a really exciting time for the team. Let's talk Minecraft as a whole though. That game, I have nothing to back this up, but I feel like everyone on the planet's played Minecraft at this point. Um, but that wasn't enough for you all. You all went and made Minecraft Dungeons, and now we're moving on to the recently revealed Minecraft Legends. So one, tell me a little bit about what it means for the team to actually be able to reveal the game, and then two, just let us know what Minecraft Legends is. Oh, well, we are so excited to finally be able to talk about this game with the world. Uh, we've been working on this game for some time now. Minecraft Legends is an action strategy game is set in the Minecraft universe. And in order to build this, we really wanted to partner with a great company that understands strategy games. And so that's when we reached out with Blackbird Interactive. And in doing so, we were able to create an experience that is uh, welcoming for you know, people who may have not played Minecraft, but also people who have. And I mean, you've seen the trailer. It's about going and traveling through these beautiful biomes, uh, exploring this world that is familiar yet still mysterious. And so as you explore these lush biomes, you collect resources, and then you use those resources to, to build defenses from these dangerous but very cute piglins. And uh, in those offensive, you're able to, to fight them back and send them back to where they come from. And you know what? You're going to probably want to build some alliances with some unexpected friends because they're going to help you actually defeat the piglins and send them back to where they come from. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. And I feel I love what you said about um, trying to make a game that's both for uh, fans of Minecraft that exist and new fans coming in. Uh, Minecraft can go in so many different directions, I feel like, with a new game. Uh, what made you choose action strategy? 
Well, really, it was a, you know, many years ago, it was a group of, of folks at Mojang sitting around talking about what game genres they really enjoy. And action and strategy were, were the most popular ones that came up. And so we started to think about who we could partner with to build that experience. And that's where we, we came into Blackbird Interactive. And that was back in 2018. And, you know, the, the project was codenamed Badger. And uh, an interesting little fact for many of those people that, that might follow Minecraft, if you go back to MineCon 2018 and you look at the shirt that Jens Berenstein was wearing, you'll see a graphic on there. And it's in the shape of a badger head. And really, that was meant to be an Easter egg for years for forward, which here we are now. And that's I got to say, I love a good Easter egg. Um, now, where would you say that Minecraft Legends fits in the overall Minecraft universe? Well, the Minecraft universe is just always growing and expanding. And if it's not from our partner communities, then it's from Mojang specifically. Like you mentioned uh, Minecraft Dungeons. That's a great example where Mojang went out and we built this dungeon crawler experience in the Minecraft universe and players love it. It's, it's wonderful. And with Minecraft Legends, we're trying to do something similar really. And here we're gonna be introducing a narratively driven campaign with a whole bunch of new characters and a lot of other things that I'm not ready to share right now. Uh, Dennis, I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. You can share it with me and everyone watching. <laughs> no? Okay, I won't, I won't pry any, any more. But tell us when the game is coming out and where we can keep up to date. It's coming out in 2023 on PC and console on Xbox Game Pass. And if you want to know more, just follow us uh, Twitter or you know, jump on Minecraft.net. Uh, Dennis, I'm so excited to jump into Minecraft Legends. Thank you so much for stopping by and giving us the lowdown. Uh, thanks for having me. What up, everybody? It's your boy Kirsten, aka Kayvon Duba. We're here at Xbox Fan Fest. We got a whole lot for y'all to check out, so let's get it in. Ask me what year Halo came out, won this sweet jersey. I couldn't believe when I was here on site that I would get to meet the real Master Chief. Experience here, out of this world, it was really cool to see. I'm gonna go get my nails done because they have a nail station and these things need to be painted. Redfall looks Ooh. dynamite and come on, Diablo 4. Oh, so Why are you so gruesome? It's all bloody things. No, but it's great, I love it. What a day we had today. Thank you everybody for showing up to Xbox Fan Fest Toronto. Had a lot of fun, saw a lot of games, great experiences overall. Catch you in the next one. Joined now by Sarah Bond, who leads the gaming ecosystem organization here at Xbox. Sarah, it's so great to have you. It is awesome to be here and so good to see you too. Yes, I'm super excited for this conversation because as we know, game creators are crucial to Xbox's success. And whenever you talk about them, it's with such like 
passion and tenacity. I love it. And it sounds super important to you and the rest of Team Xbox. So my question to you is, how do creators inspire the work that you and your team do? The creators are just the bedrock of everything we do on my team. You know, when you really think about it, what, where gaming really comes from is it starts with someone who has a creative idea that they choose to put into a game that we all get to experience and enjoy. And that's really the bedrock of our industry, of what motivates us, is to help those people, those developers, bring their stories out. And we think about it in three ways. You know, how do we create a vibrant and engaging gamer community for them to come to through Xbox? What are the set of tools and services that we give them that make it easier and faster and more affordable for them to make a game? And how do we create a range of business models that they can use? Because a business model really enables them to perform all sorts of different types of innovation. Yeah, business models, tools, resources, all these provide choices and it's increasing these choices for not only the developers, but the players themselves as well. Yeah. For example, you and your team just announced a new feature that's going to bring game demos to players. Can you tell us a little bit more about Project Morecroft? Project Morecroft. I know. I love these project names. I wish they would just let me name it, but yeah, they just won't. Say it. I know. You know. They won't. Can we change that? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we were sitting around as a team and we were thinking about some of the things that we've always loved the most about the gaming industry. And one of them was remember when you would go to like a show? like PAX or E3, and you would go and you would go to the show floor and you get to play a demo or a piece of a game and the developer would be right there next to you, talking to you about their experience, asking you to try things out, asking you your feedback. And that was one of the things I loved the most about those experiences. We just don't have them as much anymore, you know, in, in the way that the world has evolved. And so we thought, gosh, how can we make Game Pass like that? Like, how can we use the power of Game Pass and all of the great discovery and player engagement that is in it and have it create for creators that opportunity to engage with fans early as they're creating their game and also for players to get to experience something that they're really anticipating? And so that's what we're going to do. We're actually going to have a program that enables developers to take a piece, a level of their game, and put it into Game Pass so that they can get that great feedback and players can engage with them. And we know it's a lot of work sometimes for developers to do that, so we're also going to compensate them for their participation in the program. I'm so excited for what's going to come when we launch that. I think the one thing that we all miss is that connection, right? And now that we are able to come back into conferences and stuff like that, we still need to deepen it because yeah. by deepening that connection, you're diversifying the voices. And then that in return helps to diversify the games and bring diversity into games. Completely. So how will Microsoft help to further that front? Yeah, we think about it all the time, frankly, as Microsoft, as Xbox, in my team in particular, because creators is core to everything we do. You know, if you think about a game, it enables you to experience a perspective, a point of view, in a way that is deep and immersive, unlike any other form of media. So the importance of everyone having an equal opportunity to share their story and their perspective through a game, and what it means to shaping our perceptions, to what we talk about, to what we believe, uh, to broadening our perspectives, uh, is critical. And we think about that all the time. So. What we've done as a team is we're continuing to expand the set of developers who we're engaging with and bringing them into the Xbox ecosystem. We've actually more than doubled the number of developers that are making games for Xbox, and we saw lots of those games in the last day, which has been pretty cool. And the other thing that we did this year is for the first time ever, we actually have a presence in Africa. We have our first Xbox employee in Africa, specifically dedicated to working with creators in the region. So what message would you like to leave for creators who are interested in starting in the industry? Yeah, I get that question a lot. People say to me, gosh, I would really like to get be part of the gaming industry. I'd love to make a game. How do I break through? How do I get involved? And I say, first of all, network. Talk to people, meet people, connect with people. Just how you and I connected, actually, at an industry event, which we <laughs> met at, which was super fun. You know, build that network and that connectivity because it's so critical in every industry, but yes. I think particularly in gaming, right? You know, go to industry conferences like GDC, meet people, learn, try that out. And if you're interested in making a game for Xbox, you can actually go to GitHub.com. You can actually download the Xbox Game Developer Kit and get started. And once you have a game concept, you can also submit it online through ID at xbox.com, and then you can self-publish to Xbox, which is another great way. And of course, if you actually want to get involved in the industry, all companies are great, but I highly recommend you check out Coming to Work at Xbox. <laughs>
I'm biased, obviously. I mean, yeah, you have every right to be so. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. And also, thank you to all the viewers for tuning into Extended. We've heard from so many amazing developers on today's show. Now, before we finish, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? We were talking earlier about the importance of people being able to tell their story through a game and how incredibly powerful it is. I mean, when we were talking about that, I was thinking about an experience we've had as a team that's been very touching for me. So, you know, a couple years ago, we started really consciously extending the depth and breadth of content that we have in the Xbox ecosystem. And it was through that that I got to know the team making Stalker 2 really well. And I actually got to intro that game last year in the Xbox Game Showcase, and it was just incredible. And you know, the thing was that I was looking at that game last year and I was looking at the story that they were telling and they were talking about the beauty of the land and their dedication to their culture and their country. And I thought, wow, this is a cool game. This is a compelling story. But sitting here today, you know, recognizing that that team is Ukrainian, they were based in Kiev, looking at that story and what they were showing to the world just feels entirely different in far more poignant and visceral to me. You know, you're, you're, this is a team who's talking about their culture, talking about fighting for the existence of being a nation, of being a people, of having their own language. And now we all as a world have gotten to see how tenuous that in fact is. And it's an honor, frankly, to be part of this industry and to have the opportunity to uplift their voices and to let their story be told through a gaming experience, especially knowing what we know now about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, and as part of that, they actually shared with us something that they wanted us to share with all of you today as part of the show. Кипела работа, идеи, она не останавливалась. Три месяца назад началась война России с Украиной. Шок от рабочий день начинается тревоги. Сейчас сильный обстрел. Мы бежим в укрытие. Это переноска для моего кота, который загинул еще в первый тиждень войны. Ходишь вечером, сирена. Ходишь днем, сирена. Днем еще работать надо. Поэтому особо не выйдешь, а вечером все время вот так. Это мое рабочее место. Уже третий месяц я живу и працюю в коридоре. Зі мною живе однокий пес, врятованный из-под обстрела в Хостомеле. Зараз мне важко писать квести про войну, когда она идет навколо. Так работает перерыв между сиренами и волонтерскими задачами. Свет еще побачит, насколько у нас классная культура и в том числе насколько классные игры мы можем делать. Меня зовут Александр. Я являюсь сотрудником компании ЖСК. Я смотрю их. С начала боевых действий была потеряна связь с моими родными и близкими. И это непередаваемое ужасное чувство, когда ты не знаешь Живы они или нет? Я Дмитрий Ясенев, разработчик сталкера. Никола не мог выйти, что в 21-м столетии, в центре Европы, может стать полномасштабная война. Я Алексей Иванов, комьюнити-менеджер проекта Stalker 2. 
і зброю в руках захищає свою країну від російської агресії. Привіт, я Макс, наративний дизайнер гри Stalker 2. Після перемоги я до неї повернуся. Побачимось на релізі. Слава Україні! Last question, Dr. Dallin. Are you sure the perimeter surrounding the zone is really enough? If a powerful emission were to occur, we would... Listen. The zone has remained stable for years. Besides, we didn't establish the most advanced institution in human history without first guaranteeing its safety. As the head of the Scientific Institute for Research of the Chernobyl area, or circa for short, I believe the wonders that we will bring to the world far outweigh the potential risks. How big are these risks exactly? <laughs> the zone reveals a whole new world. We can stick with the old one, fearing change. But tell me, do you want our descendants to remember us as cowards? Or as those who dared to venture forward to a new, better humanity? Urge people to stay calm, assuring them the situation is totally under control. 